Hi everybody. In the previous series of videos which focused on statistical mechanics, we built up many of the properties of ideal gases from the standpoint of single particle energy levels. This video is sort of an interlude in some ways where we look at the properties of gases and then supercritical fluids from a macroscopic standpoint, which leads into our coverage of the macroscopic laws of thermodynamics in the upcoming videos. I suspect that some of the coverage of ideal gases in this video will be review, but we'll get to some interesting properties of supercritical fluids at the end, which is more likely to be new. What are we assuming is true of a gas when we say that it's ideal? Basically, we're assuming that it's dilute enough so that size and the interactions between the atoms or molecules are negligible. We know that atoms and molecules do have finite size, and they do interact with each other, whether it's dispersion forces or dipole-dipole interactions or hydrogen bonds. But in a gas, the atoms or molecules are usually very far away from each other relative to their size. And if there's enough space between the atoms and the molecules, then they're basically behaving as if their size and the interactions between the atoms or molecules don't matter. These equations are all just different forms of the ideal gas law, which you've probably seen before. PV equals nRT is usually the equation that's introduced in general chemistry textbooks, where P is pressure, V is volume, lowercase n is the number of moles, R is the gas constant, and T is temperature. The first form of the equation on this slide expresses volume in terms of a molar volume. V with an overline means volume per mole, or V over n. Our textbook often expresses molar quantities with an overline. And the equation on the bottom, PV equals capital N times KB times T, is basically the single particle version of the ideal gas law, where capital N is the number of particles rather than the number of moles, and KB is the Boltzmann constant, which is basically the single particle version of the gas constant. In one of our previous videos about statistical mechanics, we already motivated the ideal gas law starting from single particle energy levels, starting from quantum mechanics. But historically, that's not how the ideal gas law was developed. The ideal gas law came from various empirical relationships that were already known experimentally. Things like Boyle's law, which is the inverse relationship between pressure and volume, Charles's law, which is the direct relationship between volume and temperature, and Avogadro's law, which is the direct relationship between volume and number of moles. For the purposes of this course, I basically think of all of these named laws as kind of chemistry historical trivia. I would rather you just see that the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT, implies all of these empirical relationships if you hold certain quantities constant. In other words, if you hold the number of moles and the temperature constant, you can see that Boyle's law must be true. You can see that there must be an inverse relationship between pressure and volume. For the most part, using the ideal gas law often just comes down to plugging in numbers. But the one thing I'd like to point out is that it's important to keep track of units. Whatever units you use in the ideal gas law, make sure they match. Typically, the units of R, the gas constant, give you a hint as to what units you should be using. One form of R, R equals 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, is the form that you would use if you're using SI units. And if you use that form of the gas constant, Pressure is going to be in pascals, the SI unit of pressure. Volume is going to be in cubic meters. Remember, cubic meters is the SI unit of volume, not liters. And temperature will be in Kelvin. Alternatively, if you use another common form of the gas constant, 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres over mole Kelvin, then you'd need to use all of those same units in the other quantities. Pressure in atmospheres, volume in liters, and temperature in Kelvin. I'd like to talk briefly about kinetic molecular theory, which is a way of viewing the macroscopic properties of ideal gases like pressure and temperature in terms of the classical movements of the atoms and molecules and their collisions with each other and with the walls of the container that they're in. Kinetic molecular theory makes a few assumptions. It assumes that we're talking about an ideal gas that has no intermolecular attractions and in which the particles have no volume. It also assumes that all collisions are elastic, meaning no energy is lost. And it assumes that the speeds of the atoms and molecules are in something called a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. We'll see pictures of those distributions later in these slides. But for the time being, just know that that means that the atoms and molecules don't all have the same speed as each other. 
they're in a probabilistic distribution of different speeds. From this viewpoint, the pressure of a gas can be thought of in terms of the forces exerted by the individual collisions of the particles with the walls of a container. You may remember that pressure is a force per unit area of the walls of a container. So it stands to reason that for an ideal gas, that pressure is going to be proportional to, first of all, the frequency of the collisions per unit area of the container, so the more collisions, the more pressure, times the average force that each collision exerts on the walls of a container. More force means more pressure. We're not going to formally derive the expression for pressure here, but we're going to set up a proportion. Pressure is proportional to the frequency of collisions per unit area times the average force per collision. The frequency of the collisions, or the number of collisions per unit time, is going to be proportional to the number of particles over the volume times the average velocity. VRMS means root mean squared velocity, which is just a fancy way of taking the average velocity. The reason for this is that capital N over capital V is the density of particles in the container. Which makes sense. If you double the number of particles in the container, you're going to double the number of collisions that those particles have per unit area. And the reason why the frequency of collisions is proportional to the average velocity is that if a particle is flying around a container twice as fast, it's going to collide with the walls twice as often. So this makes sense, that the frequency of collisions is proportional to not only the density of particles in the container, but also the average speed of those particles. And the average force that each of those collisions exerts on the walls of the container is going to be proportional to the mass of a particle times the average speed of a particle. You may remember from physics that mv is the momentum of a particle, and it makes sense that this would be proportional to the force of a collision because force is actually the rate of change of a momentum of a particle. So the more momentum a particle carries going into a wall, the more force it's going to exert on the wall. So the pressure on the walls of the container is going to be proportional to the product of these two terms. A more complete derivation for this is in the textbook, and I encourage you to take a look at it if you're interested, but here is the expression that comes out of it. Pressure equals the number of particles over three times the volume times the mass of a particle times its average velocity squared. What we're now going to do is to use this expression for pressure that comes from kinetic molecular theory to learn something important about what temperature means in an ideal gas. So here's the expression for pressure that we just found. We can multiply both sides of the equation by volume to get PV equals number of particles times mass times velocity squared over 3. We know that we have another important equation, the ideal gas law, that has an expression for PV. And we can now set the right sides of these two equations equal to each other. NMV squared over 3 equals NKBT. The Ns are going to cancel. And I'm also going to do something that seems kind of arbitrary here and multiply both sides of the equation by 3 halves to get 1 half mv squared equals 3 halves kbt. The reason why I multiplied both sides by 3 halves is that 1 half mv squared, as you may remember, is an expression for the kinetic energy of the atoms or molecules. So what we have here is an equation that says the average kinetic energy of the gas atoms or molecules, 1 half mv squared, equals 3 halves kbt, a constant times the temperature. The interesting thing about this is that it means the kinetic energy of the gas atoms or molecules is the same constant times temperature regardless of what the atoms or molecules actually are. Whether it's a very light gas like hydrogen or a heavier one like xenon, at a given temperature the atoms or molecules of that gas are going to carry the same kinetic energy. I'd like to ask a couple questions here to emphasize the importance of this equation. This figure shows three different distributions of speeds, A, B, and C. And these distributions are actually the Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions that I referred to a few slides ago, where atoms and molecules come in a whole range of different speeds. My first question is, if these three curves represent the same gas at three different temperatures, which of these temperatures is the coldest? I'll give you a few seconds to think about this. If these three curves all refer to the same gas, then m, the mass, isn't changing. The only things that are changing are the velocity, vrms, 
and the temperature T. You can see that we have V squared on one side of the equation and T on the other side of the equation, meaning that as one of them increases, the other one also increases. In other words, we expect that at a higher temperature, we're going to see on average higher speeds. That means that the coldest temperature is going to be the one where on average the particles are going at the slowest speeds. So that will be curve A. The other question I'd like to ask is if these curves represent different gases at the same temperature, then which of the three curves represents the heaviest gas? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. In this case, the temperature isn't changing, so the entire right side of the equation, 3 halves kBt, remains constant. That means 1 half mv squared is equal to a constant. So as m gets larger, v must be getting smaller. That means the heaviest gas is going to be the one that has, on average, the slowest speeds. Again, that's going to be curve A. So far, throughout this video, we've assumed that gases are ideal. But in reality, gases deviate from ideal behavior. The figure on this slide shows, for several gases at room temperature, the relationship between the quantity PV bar over RT versus the pressure. Remember that the ideal gas law tells us that PV bar equals RT, which means that for an ideal gas, PV bar over RT would equal 1 regardless of pressure. That's why if you look at the line that's labeled ideal gas, it's at a value of 1 for all pressures. But you can see that for all of the other real gases, the behavior is more complicated. The curves sometimes go below 1 and they sometimes go above 1. You can see that as the pressure gets very low, all of the curves approach 1. That means that as we would expect, for very low pressures where the gas is very dilute, all gases approach ideal behavior. Also, if you look at the scale on the pressure axis, and remember that atmospheric pressure is around one bar, you can see that all of these gases at atmospheric pressure are pretty close to ideal. It's only at very high pressures that the behavior gets far from ideal. I'd like you to think a little bit about what physically it means for these curves to be below 1 or above 1. In other words, what does it mean in terms of their atomic size or their interatomic interactions? Conceptually, I think about it this way. Where the curves are below 1, that means that the attractions between the atoms or the molecules are dominating. In other words, if PV bar over RT is below 1, then that means the pressure or the molar volume are less than you would expect it to be for an ideal gas. In other words, the atoms or molecules are being pulled towards each other. Where the curves are above 1, that means the repulsions, or the atomic size, is dominating. In other words, the pressure and or the molar volume are more than you would expect them to be for an ideal gas. That's because the finite size of the atoms or molecules are forcing them to be farther away from each other. The deviations from ideal gas behavior can be modeled by one of a number of equations. Probably the most well-known of those equations is the van der Waals equation, which is shown here. You can see that in addition to our usual parameters, pressure, volume, and temperature, there's also a lowercase a and a lowercase b, which are experimental parameters that depend on what gas you're talking about. So you can look up the values of a and b for a given atom or molecule. Notice that this equation shows some resemblance to the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law is p v bar equals r t, which you could also write as p equals r t over v bar. The van der Waals equation tells us that p equals r t over v bar minus a little bit, and then from that whole thing, you subtract another term, A over V bar squared. To some extent, you can think of A and B as just experimental parameters that you can look up, but they do carry some physical significance, and I'd like you to think for a few seconds about what you think A and B represent physically, and what their units would be. Let's start with A. You can see that A is a part of a term at the end of the equation that gets subtracted from the pressure. In other words, A is responsible for the pressure being a little bit less than you would expect. And so A represents the interatomic or intermolecular attractions. 
whether they be van der Waals interactions or dipole-dipole interactions. And so atoms or molecules that have stronger intermolecular attractions will have larger values of A. In terms of units, you can see that the term A over V bar squared has to have units of pressure. So A must have units of pressure times molar volume squared. B, on the other hand, is a term that gets subtracted from the molar volume. Where the ideal gas law just has a V bar term, the van der Waals equation has V bar minus B. You can think of B as representing the space that the atoms or molecules actually take up. Because the atoms or molecules are taking up space, they effectively have less room to move around, which is why we have this term V bar minus B. B represents the space that you have to subtract. So larger atoms or molecules tend to have larger values of B. You can see from this equation that the units of B have to match the units of V bar, so B also has units of molar volume, volume per mole. Our conclusions are summarized here. A represents the strength of the intermolecular interactions and has units of pressure times molar volume squared, and B represents atomic or molecular size and has units of molar volume. Finally, looking at this equation, I'd like you to think about under what conditions does a real gas approach ideal behavior? I'll give you a few seconds to think about that. A gas approaches ideal behavior when the molar volume is large relative to A and B. You can imagine that if V bar is a lot bigger than A and B, that last term, A over V bar squared, will go away. And the denominator of the first term, V bar minus B, will be dominated by V bar. So if the molar volume is large, we're left with something that approaches P equals RT over V bar, which is the ideal gas law. One thing that's interesting about the van der Waals equation is that because we're including atomic or molecular size and intermolecular forces, then in principle we can describe not only gases, but also liquids and supercritical fluids. And that's the topic I'd like to end this video with. When you first learn about the phases of matter, you typically learn about solids, liquids, and gases, and not much about supercritical fluids. The figure on this slide is a phase diagram of CO2 that shows the phases of CO2 as a function of its pressure and its temperature. You can see that for most of the phase diagram, there are clear divisions between the solid, liquid, and gas regions, meaning that solid, liquid, and gas are three distinct phases, and that where there's a phase transition, CO2 suddenly changes from one to another. But once you get beyond a certain point called the critical point, the phase boundary between liquid and gas disappears, and you have what's called the supercritical fluid. That means that liquid and gas have now merged into just one phase, without a clear separation between the two. There are a lot of cool videos online showing how the phase boundary between the liquid and gas phases of CO2 disappears once you get beyond the critical point. Supercritical CO2 does have some practical uses, as you can see on the right side of this slide, but the main reason I want to talk about it is that it's an interesting manifestation of the issues that we've talked about so far in this video. This figure gives us a picture of what's going on when a substance goes supercritical. The two axes show us the relationship between the pressure and the molar volume of a substance, in this case CO2. And each of the curves in the figure is an isotherm, meaning it represents a particular temperature of CO2. So this figure shows us experimentally how CO2 behaves at different temperatures and pressures. Let's look first at the curve closest to the bottom of the figure. That's the lowest temperature. You can see that over on the right side of the figure, it's labeled G, meaning gas. The gas is the phase that has the larger molar volume. It takes up more space. Over on the left side of the figure, we have a phase that's labeled L. That's the liquid. It has the lower molar volume, and it takes up less space. You can see that for the isotherm closest to the bottom of the figure, there's a sudden jump from gas to liquid as the pressure increases. First you have a gas that's taking up a lot of space, and as you raise the pressure, you have a sudden jump, where all of a sudden the gas condenses to a liquid and takes up a lot less space. This continues for a while at higher temperatures, where you have a sudden jump from the gas phase to the liquid phase. But as the temperature increases, the molar volumes of the gas and the liquid get more and more similar to each other, and that horizontal line connecting the two gets shorter and shorter, 
until eventually you reach that point that's labeled CP, the critical point. That's where the distinction between the gas and the liquid disappears completely. They now have the same molar volume, and they've merged into one phase. It's just one phase whose molar volume changes continuously as the pressure changes. That's what it looks like to go from a substance that has a phase boundary between gas and liquid to a substance that's a supercritical fluid. The lower half of this figure has a phase boundary, and the upper half of this figure is a supercritical fluid. This figure is showing us what happens experimentally for CO2. But it turns out that if you plug in numbers from the van der Waals equation, you get something pretty similar. The figure on the right is showing us the same plot, except using the van der Waals equation, with the values of A and B for carbon dioxide. Each line in this figure is again showing us an isotherm, the relationship between pressure and molar volume for a given temperature. There are some differences between these two figures. In the experimental figure, there was a horizontal line connecting the gas and liquid molar volumes. But in the figure based on the van der Waals equation, you can see that the curves kind of wiggle up and down. These wiggles, and the fact that there's not a clear phase transition, comes from the fact that the van der Waals equation is kind of an oversimplification. It tries to model a substance's behavior based entirely on two parameters, A and B, so it doesn't always do particularly well. But you can see that these two figures do share one important thing in common. The lower half of the figure is non-monotonic. In other words, the lines don't just go up or just go down. There are either wiggles or discontinuities. While the upper half of the figure is monotonic, meaning the curves just go up or just go down. Also notice that those two different regimes in both cases are separated by a critical point. A point where the curve just barely gets flat as the phase boundary disappears. We can use the van der Waals equation to mathematically find the conditions where this critical point happens. In other words, we can find the critical temperature, pressure, and molar volume of a substance in terms of the parameters A and B from the van der Waals equation. In order to do that, the important thing to recognize is that at the critical point, the isotherm in this figure just barely gets flat. And when the curve just barely gets flat, two things are true. First of all, at that critical point, the first derivative of pressure with respect to molar volume equals zero, because the curve is flat. It's also true that the second derivative of pressure with respect to molar volume is also equal to zero, because the critical point is a point of inflection. It's a point where the curve goes from concave up to concave down. So we have these two mathematical conditions, the fact that these first two derivatives of pressure with respect to molar volume are both equal to zero. And that's going to allow us to find the critical conditions of our substance. So in order to find the critical point, we can start with the van der Waals equation. Recognize that the first derivative of pressure with respect to molar volume has to be equal to zero. We can calculate the first derivative of pressure with respect to molar volume. You can check my math on this, but there it is. We can recognize that the second derivative of pressure with respect to molar volume also has to be equal to zero because the critical point is a point of inflection. We've already taken one derivative. We can now take another derivative. Again, you can check my math on that. And now we have three equations here, the van der Waals equation itself and the conditions that make the first two derivatives of pressure with respect to molar volume equal to zero. We know that in general, three equations mathematically allow us to solve for three unknowns. And in this case, our three unknowns are the critical conditions, critical molar volume, critical temperature, and critical pressure. So we could take these three equations and solve for those three unknowns. We won't do that in detail here because it wouldn't be particularly interesting to watch. So we'll just go ahead and look at the answers. If we were to solve those three equations, these are the answers that we would get. Expressions for the critical molar volume, critical temperature, and critical pressure in terms of the van der Waals parameters A and B. The final values here aren't so important, and I certainly don't suggest that you memorize them, but there are a couple things that I'd like to point out. First of all, it's pretty cool that we were able to, just using those van der Waals parameters, unambiguously solve for the conditions under which a substance goes supercritical. Also notice what the value of the critical molar volume is here. It's 3b. Remember that b roughly represents the amount of space that the atoms or molecules take up. So what this is telling us intuitively is that a substance goes supercritical when you're really not giving it a lot of space. 
when the volume that you give it is just a few times larger than the volume of the atoms or molecules themselves. The message that I'd like you to come away with here is that supercriticality, which at first looks like kind of a mysterious phenomenon, actually isn't as mysterious as it seems. It's really something that naturally comes out of the idea that atoms or molecules have both finite size and intermolecular attractions. That's all for now. In the next few videos, we'll move on to the macroscopic laws of thermodynamics.